Hucknall. And we're here with Rock Design, based out of our Munich studio. And we're going to talk to you about Rock's Collaborative Action Toolkit. We know there's been a tremendous amount of discussion about collaboration, sharing, groups, and making stuff. And this is a toolkit that will allow you to engage in all of those activities. First, a quick word with Rock. We're a global design and innovation company located in um, 10 places globally. Our roots are in the Black Forest. Hartmut Esslinger is the founder of Frog, and his initial claim to fame was some early work with Steve Jobs on the first all-white Macintosh, the Snow White design language. But since then, Frog has emerged, uh, evolved, broadened our scope. So we're not only doing industrial design projects now, but digital, but experience design as well. Our work goes from design research all the way through to actually making and building And it is critical for us that our solutions be truly meaningful, have value, and be impactful. Our motto is love what you make. And we feel like this passion shows through in the work, in everything that, that we do. But not only is this a true statement for designers, but also for makers, for innovators, and for entrepreneurs. You're here today, I'm sure, because you love what you make. Collaboration is another piece that is essential to the design process, but it's another piece that we also have in common with the sharing and collaborative economy. Because the collaboration of diverse people, diverse backgrounds, and diverse opinions is what make our solutions impactful and make a phenomenal difference at the end of the day. So I just want to take a minute to talk about the design process as a little bit of a history around the evolution of process of starting with defining your goals, right? What are we here to do? What problem do we want to solve? And hey, let's go out and listen to what people have to say and look at what they do. So these images are from a series of projects around home appliances, um, but not just the appliance themselves, but about understanding the entire ecosystem that surrounds that experience and understanding how can we design and improve that ecosystem. And after we have defined what we're doing, we've looked, we've listened, we're going to try out some solutions, sketching, building prototypes, as many of you do as makers and entrepreneurs. And then guess what happens? Not always, but pretty often, there's kind of a fail moment. Um, we like to think of it maybe not so much as fail, but maybe closer to learn. And this was a little prototype for a touch screen interface on a refrigerator, and we built it on an iPad. And hung it up on the wall at refrigerator height, and got a bunch of people in to use it. And yeah, it didn't make a lot of sense to most people. So it was sort of back to the drawing board, start over. Um, and, and this happens. So the process is not only define, look, listen, try, learn, but then repeat. So we began to ask ourselves, OK, this is Here you have the designer at the drawing board working together from diverse backgrounds and disciplines and learning. But then we began to realize, hey, the more people we bring in from the community, from the places where, we're, our, where our products and services are going to impact, we're going to learn faster. Our results are going to be better. So one of the first projects where we really became heavily involved in the community So this project focused on girls in impoverished communities in Africa and India. And we wanted to help understand how can we empower them to live their lives in a circumstance that allows them to finish school and to become mothers when they're ready to become mothers. So many of these young girls were taken out of school and married at a very young age where they become pregnant, generally against their will. And that is So the Nike Foundation project involved weeks and weeks on the ground with these girls and giving them tools to really capture their own stories, tell their own stories, ah, okay, tell their own stories and come up with solutions 
that would make a difference to their lives. The impact was phenomenal. The girls' stories, their own ideas, um, were what really began to make a difference. We prototyped a tool that triggered both digital and face-to-face -face interactions between girls where they could make connections with each other and have a community to help them stand up to their parents and say, no, I want to finish school, or stand up to other people in the community with their own vision for their own independent future. Um, and while this project was successful in many ways, we realized we could make it even better. So, is there a way that's even better? And one of the first things we noticed from this Girl Effect project was, oops, <laughs> sorry, was if we got the designers out of the way, what would happen if groups got to actually do their own work and do their own collaboration and see the difference that they could make in their communities? And I think every one of you here today knows there's real power in groups, but often it's hard to really get groups to work together, isn't it? It's not the easiest thing, it's, uh, a, it's a real challenge. But we can see from other communities and learn from them that there's great power when people can work together. So if you take away one thing from our talk today, it's that we believe that groups make change. It's not an I community, it's a we community, hence we share. Um, when we think about groups making change, and we think about how to get groups together, it can be a challenge. And we want to talk to you about how the Collective Action Toolkit can actually help create groups and build synergy and teams. When we think about making, it's really easy to sit around a table, isn't it, and have a conversation with people and come up with ideas. But one of the things that designers do is we make. And one of the things we want to transfer to the collaborative community is to say, if you can make something tangible, somebody stands a chance of actually engaging with it. And then change, the big word. It's very lofty of me to stand up here and say groups make change, but change is hard. Um, and we want to talk to you about a plan for action as to how you can make change. So, introducing, if this is your first exposure, the Collective Action Toolkit. It's a download online. We've brought some here today because we're running a bar camp later. But really, it is a set of activities based around six categories. And these categories start with the goal in the very center, because we don't want to start ambiguously. We want to start with a plan. But we want to move, and you'll notice the diagram changes, to begin to have a bit of a flow, where you get to build a team it's really important if you're going to have a collective group acting on something, you actually have a team that wants to commit to each other. But you always come back to the center, the thing that refocuses you collectively, but you have imaginative, creative activities around it, 25 of them in fact, to be able to engage your team and reflect on what the ultimate plan for action will be. So the great thing about a toolkit is we're not prescribing rules to you. We're giving you something that is usable and accessible and adaptable. So things you can adapt when you start to look inside of the toolkit is how long it takes. We've made some proposals of how long we think it takes to get people talking to each other. You may need more time, you need, may need less. How many people? A lot of you are talking from different sectors here today at WeShare. So some of you are working more in the government sector. You may have a lot more bureaucracy and a lot more people to get around the table. Um, so depending on your environment or your industry, that could shift. The materials you use. We use post-it notes, sticky notes a lot in design, but you may not have access to that. Some of the work with the girl effect, you don't necessarily have something on the wall, so you need to be able to adapt your materials. And lastly, how people express themselves. Um, you'll notice some of the things we suggest are things like skits and actions, um, which some people are really insecure about. But oftentimes, it's a great way to create stories and have a, an opportunity to share in a different way. Things we want you to keep, and these are really high-level values, and they may sound really lofty yet again, but I think they are the important thing because it's the values that will actually sustain, is to always allow unique points of view. I'm sure you've sat around a table with people and it's been frustrating and annoying and you don't agree, but if you allow that unique point of view, you can actually open up the door for some really creative thinking trust each other. We just heard about trust as a big issue in the sharing economy. But really the activities in here are meant to help to develop and build trust with a team to work collaboratively together. Sharing the ownership. 
as I said earlier, it's not an I project, it's a we project. And so if we start to share and let everyone have a vested interest um, and that commitment and that posture to shared ownership, then you can begin to see the project have some success and some continuity. Remaining flexible, no, it's not yoga. It's actually remaining flexible in your personality. Maybe yoga will help, but we really know that this is the, the way that designers work. We have to be open and very adaptable, and flexibility in the situation is obviously key. And lastly, make it tangible. If we can't show something, it's very hard for people to engage with the products and services that we develop in the same way when we're talking about new types of sharing economy outcomes, we need to be able to show people something that they can grab onto. Sorry. Here's a video just to give you a little overview. Music's coming from somewhere else, hold on. It's great music, nothing wrong with it. It's gonna make it hard to hear the video. So this video um, provides a little bit of an overview of the Collective Action Toolkit, and then we have some scenes from one of our initial pilot projects uh, that we want to share with you. So as we mentioned earlier, you can download the Collective Action Toolkit online for free at the website here. We also have a number of copies. So if you're joining us for the bar camp, you will receive a copy. These are now images from one of our early pilots of the Collective Action Toolkit. This took place in Savannah, Georgia. There is a design school there and the students took the Collective Action Toolkit into the classrooms of the local high schools. And the students in the high school chose what they wanted to focus on. These kids decided the bigger, one of the big problems in their community was violence. They wanted to address that issue and began to come up with a plan for a violence-free week, which may not sound significant to us, but for them and where they live and their circumstances, having a violence-free week was a significant step. And being proactive in organizing that was very powerful. They presented it to their principal who came back to us and said he was absolutely amazed to see these students proactively moving forward with an idea and not just complaining. That's him standing there on the right. Um, so we have a number of these trials that have run with tremendous success, but with each round, we also get feedback and <coughs> begin to improve our process. So thank you very much. Merci. Merci.